visiting the White House for the first time, I want to understand the Department's work. More than most people, those of you in this room will remember the talk a few years ago about the reindustrialization of America. Most of this discussion was well intentioned, focused on strengthening America's industrial base. But here and there were the old suggestions about the need for central planning and massive government expenditures to bring all this about. People agreed then, and I believe they agree now. They voted our way on election day. They also made their voices heard during all those crucial legislative battles over spending and taxes. I think our people are disillusioned with the policies of big government, with boom and bust, with high inflation followed by higher unemployment. Think back to 1980. Interest rates, 21.5%. Double-digit inflation for two years in a row. Productivity and the rate of growth in the gross national product dropping for the second year in a row. Almost 8 million people were unemployed and business failures were increasing. Then came the present recession, a legacy from the years of spend and spend and tax and tax, and even more Americans out of work. Well, in six days, our economic program will have been in place one year. It has brought down interest rates. It's gotten the gross national product going in the right direction. It's given us the first real tax cut for individuals in almost 20 years and gotten inflation. Only a year ago, the number one economic concern of most Americans, down from 12.4% in 1980 to an annual rate of 5.1% since January. Maybe it's time to ask Speaker O'Neill and the liberal leadership of his party if they really want to return to the policies that gave us a trillion dollar debt? Are they willing to pledge to the American people that when a new Congress begins next year, they won't try to take away the income tax cuts and the historic reform of indexing taxes to inflation, which probably was the biggest tax increase over the years this nation has ever had? Let me go a step further and speak a moment about one of our major concerns right now, jobs. You might have noticed the rhetoric from our liberal critics has already reached a crescendo. The trouble is that they call their compassionate solution the perfect illustration of what they call, I should say, their compassionate solution is the perfect illustration of why the United States is suffering from such deep-rooted problems. Last week, they stampeded the House with another temporary public make-work program for, at best, 200,000 people. It would carry all the old flaws of that wasteful, discredited CETA program. Most important, it's no answer for the man or woman laid off, sitting around the table at nights, wondering how they'll put their future back together again. We've taken a different approach. Beginning way back in February, we started working on a program that would meet criteria for a real long-term solution. The Senate House Conference just acted yesterday, and I called on the entire Congress to act next week to pass this legislation that will provide job training for one million people or more per year in the private sector. 
So my question to the speaker is, which is it going to be, Tip? Temporary or permanent? 200,000 or 1 million? Make work or training for lasting jobs? A political solution of spend and spend, borrow and borrow, or real economic opportunity for people looking to us for effective help and leadership. We can't go back to the failed policies of the past. We must stay the course toward less inflation and more jobs. But beyond issuing this challenge and citing the statistical evidence of how far we've come, we intend to remind the American people of an even more important change. In this administration, we haven't talked about the era of limitations or no growth or learning to do with less. We've talked about, instead, incentive, opportunity, and expansion. We're emphasizing the all-important goal of capital formation as the way to expand and renew our industrial base. We haven't tried to get government to redistribute a shrinking economic pie. We've come up with a recipe for a bigger and better pie that all Americans can share in. Now, incidentally, let me interject that with all this economic talk that this morning some of the press began speculating that somehow recent attempts on some social issues, such as the place of prayer in school, the abortion problem and all, were somehow just a political gimmick and now we discarded that and we're moving on to something else. I believe this country is hungry for a spiritual revival. I also believe that what Teddy Roosevelt said once is true. The presidency is a bully pulpit, and we're not going to give up on those social issues that have to do with the morals of this country and the great standards that made this country great. We'll be working for them. <laughs> thing, we're rebuilding America's military and strategic strength. We've adopted a foreign policy that speaks openly and candidly about the failure of totalitarianism, a foreign policy that advocates the moral superiority of Western ideals like personal freedom and representative government, a foreign policy that calls for a global crusade for freedom and democracy. It's this combination of strategic strength and rhetorical candor that for the first time in years has taken American foreign policy off the defensive. Most important, it strengthened the chances for a lasting peace by providing a credible base for important new peace initiatives, especially in the arms control area and in regions like the Middle East. A new political consensus, the support of the American people has made all of this possible. Our institutions are working again, and this time for the people and not against them. I don't mind saying, I think that's a record to be proud of. I think, I, th I think it's something the American people want continued. And that's the message we're going to get to them this fall. And now you're going to get your dessert and I'm going to sit down and have a cup of coffee with you. wanted it to be very successful and worked for weeks on it and then stood up for an evening service in a little church out in Oklahoma and there was only one fellow out there in all the midst of the empty pews so he went down after the opening music and said my friends you seem to be the only member of the congregation that showed up and I'm just a young preacher getting started what do you think should I go through with it and the fellow said I'm just a little old cowpoke out here in Oklahoma but I do know this if I loaded up a truckload of hay to took it out in the prairie and only one cow showed up, I'd feed her. <laughs> well, the young preacher took that as a cue, got back up in the pulpit, and an hour and a half later said, Amen. He went down and he said, My friend, you seem to have stuck with me, and as I told you, I'm a young preacher getting started. What did you think? And he says, Well, like I told you, I don't know about that sort of thing, but I do know this. If I loaded up a truckload of hay, took it out in the prairie, and only one cow showed up, I sure as hell wouldn't give her the whole load. <laughs> They've given me a little time here, so <laughs> anyone has a question? Mr. President, before you do take questions, I would like to say thank you for sharing your time with us today. 
more importantly, for your significant recognition of the business press. To the best of my knowledge, you're the first president since Harry Truman who was so honored us in this way. And we hope that you'll find it well enough worthwhile that this will be the beginning of an annual business press White House Congress. Thank you. President King, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I hope it will be too, and I'm surprised that it's been so long uh, since they had that. I, I would have gone back even, I happen to agree with Mr. Coolidge, who said the business of America is business. <laughs> so, now, is someone with a question? Mr. President, uh, I come from the Chicago area. When you publish your magazine for the appliance industry, you get down about 17 percent right now in new production. Uh, we just finished polling executives in our industry, and I think you'd be pleased to know that the overwhelming message that we got back in the comments was that they strongly support your position and your, your activities, and that we think that it's going to succeed and that you keep up your work. Well, thank you very much. I don't have any answer. <laughs> We will. I, we will do that. I think that what we've seen, this is probably the eighth recession since World War II. And every one of them, we've seen government go for the quick fix, the artificial stimulant, and each time the next recession has been deeper and worse and inflation has been higher and so forth. And uh, our, our recovery isn't going to be as fast as those have been, but I think it's going to be lasting. Now there was a hand over. Yes. Yes. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to have you tell us a little bit, if you would, about how you interface with business leaders and where you get your input now from the people who are running American business. Do you do it uh, on a face-to-face -face basis? Are you doing it through your people, or are you personally talking to them in a way that will get you closer to what their problems are? Well, a little bit of all of that. Uh, not only our people, but we have an, uh, a number of meetings and a had them usually, we have them in the Roosevelt Room or the Cabinet Room, uh, business leaders of one kind or another, but also uh, with Bill Verity as chairman, uh, we now have a task force made up from the private sector of business people who are out stimulating nationwide uh, the private initiatives, the private methods of doing things. They have acquired a data bank now of what various communities have found partnerships between business and, say, their local government with regard to um, uh, the problem of dropouts in school or charitable affairs, whatever it might be. And then they are passing this word, seeing that this is distributed to all other communities so they can see what the fella in the next town is doing and do it themselves. Over 40 states so far, the governors have, to work with this task force, appointed their own statewide task forces. So we have that input. We have a businessman's task force, similar to what we did in California when I was governor, that is going into all the agencies and departments of government to come back and tell us how modern business practices can be put to work to make government more efficient, uh, more economical, more effective. And uh, so between all of those things, uh, I think we, uh, we do have contact. and. Uh, Yesterday I met with um, uh, quite a group of chief executive officers who were in here who have been working, uh, who work nationally on the summer jobs program. And similar to in New York, what they call partnership, where the business community and the government got together to see how many young people could be put to work. And the meeting yesterday was not only to thank them for a job well done this summer, but to make sure that they were on hand <laughs> to do it again next summer. Uh, Mr. President, I represent uh, the apparel manufacturing industry, which, as you know, is one of the nation's most impacted industries. Lawrence is employer of the unskilled, uneducated, and minority groups. And I applaud your efforts and Ambassador Brock's efforts to hold back the pressure of imports. I applaud your non-protectionism policy, but in your capital foundation situation, accelerated depreciation, when can we get this? When can we have, have to achieve this to be on a part to survive as the apparel manufacturing industry? Not the textile industry, the apparel manufacturing industry. Accelerated depreciation. Well, now, uh, this I know is that I'm looking desperately around here for help because <laughs> I know that this is a part of our tax package. I think that uh, 
Ambassador Brock, I spoke with him in Nashville last week, and holding back the pressure of the of crown manufacturers to stop imports because of the globalization, yeah. non protection, which we agree with. But in trying to do this, the only way we can survive is by mechanization, and we can't get them through Congress in any bills or anything like that because we are a different industry. We're impacted and we're labor intense. Well, now, I'm sorry. one of my people here that don't know because I thought that this was in. Yes, Mr. Feldstein. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking about. Certainly, the tax law was changed. That accelerated depreciation is now available to all industry. Talk about something special for the tech firm? Well, not Texas, sir. That's one of the big mistakes. Power manufacturing. Power manufacturing. We have two distinct industries. And while globalization and non protection is in this administration's policy, which is excellent, 1053 doesn't do it when a plant in Germany can write off. Uh, for one year, and we have to still take five. And we have third world countries, and we can't mechanize until we get some parity with WC countries. You'd like to see more incentives for capital formation? For our industry, because it's so labor intense. Uh, I, I just want to know that that is in it. Well, let's, let's look into that, see what that situation is. We'd be very happy. I'll be glad to give you 55 position papers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'd like to have them. We really would. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, as Business Press publishes, we all uh, represent individual industries. And in the face of today's economy, uh, I think we are each concerned within our own industries as to what uh, you foresee as the potential of specific taxes that would apply to industries uh, in, in terms of today's economy and the need to close the budget gap. Now, what do I see as potential for uh, specific taxes as they apply to industries. We've recently had uh, taxes applied to uh, the tobacco industry, for instance, in the last ten. Oh, you talked about excise taxes. Excise taxes. Well, I have to tell you, having been dragged kicking and screaming into the support of, of uh, reforming the, <laughs> the tax system this time, because it was the only way we could continue getting the uh, continued reduction in, in government spending and all, that um, uh, I myself am personally opposed to any others. I believe in our tax cut program and the additional cut and the, uh, as I said, that will come in next July and, and then the uh, uh, indexing of the, of the tax structure. And I, I believe uh, my intention is that we go further with uh, cuts in government spending and I don't want to see any additional tax cuts. As a matter of fact, uh, I look forward to a day when, uh, or I mean uh, tax increases, I look forward to a day when uh, we can cut some more. Uh, Mr. President, a great many businessmen have made contributions as you know, to campaigns everywhere. Are, I think uh, there is some opposition now to political action committees. And my question which may be a little Harder than some of the ones that have been asked here is how do you feel about PACs in general? Would you like to see them abolished as some congressmen would or continue? No. As a matter of fact, I noticed that that there was nothing wrong with political action committees when they were all over on the other side. It was only when business began <laughs> having them that, that they became an evil. <laughs> I don't think they're an evil at all. I I do think that the uh, that some of the things that have been injected into electioneering uh, by the government, uh, I'm not totally in favor of a, of a number of those things. I believe that the, as, long as, as long as there has to be uh, publication or exposure of who contributes and who gets the contribution, uh, then I think government is going too far in their limitations as on the individual's right to do what they want to do, and that's what's led mainly to the politi political action committees. But let's be frank about this. In 1968, was that, oh, wait a minute, I got the right election? Yes, when Humphrey was running. Uh, shortly thereafter, Cope, uh, in a magazine article written by Al Barkin, the director of, of Cope, uh, revealed that they had spent $68 million on the presidential campaign on behalf of one candidate, of candidate Humphrey. And uh, there didn't seem to be any uproar about that as a political action uh, committee. No, I think that, uh, I think this is fine. Uh, 
One more question. One year, one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, this is a personal note if I may. Some years back, I recall uh, the high privilege of sharing a podium with the then governor of California in San Diego prior to a oceans industry meeting that we both attended. And uh, I had the high privilege of spending about an hour with you prior to that affair. I came away tremendously impressed with all of your philosophies and ideas and so forth. I went so far as to wager a dollar that we would be walking you in Washington in a subsequent day. <laughs> Please consider this a belated welcome, and I've come to your house to collect my buck. <laughs> I'm afraid I still owe you the dollar because I found out since I've been here. Anytime I go anyplace, I'm a group. I'm not allowed to pause here or there as we move on. I haven't had any money in my pocket since I got to work. <laughs> that wasn't a question, was it? <laughs> Let me take the one more, and then we'll call it. Yes, because I have a date with Gene Kirkpatrick. Uh, certainly with the help of exporters, uh, we will work our way out of this uh, recession. Uh, what is government? hoping to do to help U.S. manufacturers export industrial product. What can government do to help in the export of more products? Well, we have been working very hard at, at that, on that very subject. We recognize that with all of our feeling of anti-protectionism, that uh, free trade is still not completely fair trade in the world. We've been working with our allies in Europe, with Japan, uh, trying to get uh, more fair trade, to get quotas and restrictions and so forth removed. Uh, we've been successful to a degree, not as completely successful as we'd like to be. And we also uh, are doing our utmost to find and stimulate foreign markets. I know that we've, uh, uh, we've had uh, people from our administration uh, in 23 different countries simply on, uh, on agricultural uh, problems alone, trying to stimulate uh, those markets. In the Caribbean Initiative, a large part of that is based on, it's not only for national security, because that is really kind of our front door. About 50 percent of everything that we import comes through uh, by sea, uh, that area. And some of us can remember back in World War II in the early days when tankers and freighters were being sunk within sight of shore off, off Florida. But out of that, we have come forth with the Caribbean Initiative, which is a plan to help develop those little island states, but not in the usual way of the handout, but a hand up involving private enterprise there and in that kind of investment and to build their economies and all. But we're doing our utmost to uh, strengthen uh, foreign trade, but also to uh, meet eyeball to eyeball with those uh, trading partners that talk free trade but uh, don't quite have it. We're against subsidizing for export, as they are doing. And uh, we'll, we'll keep on that path. Well, I wish I... Karen, you look... There is a lady over here, and that lady hadn't asked a question yet. <laughs> All right. Just, this has to be one more, I know, because I can't keep the United Nations waiting. Thank you, Mr. President. I represent Nature Magazine, which is a scientific magazine, possibly one of the best scientific journals in the world. I'd like to ask you. <laughs> Let me just answer that question, but I think it's quite a coincidence that you and Jim Watt managed to get to the same, same table. <laughs> must have been an interesting conversation over there. Uh, let me just say this one thing, and 
uh, I am as opposed to, to censorship as anyone. But a problem that is just, I think, now being recognized as it should have been in years past is the extent to which uh, we have uh, given our potential adversary, the Soviet Union, American technology. Uh, it has been stolen by them, but also it has been given to them by us just with carelessness in our own attempt to be an open society to the point that they have uh, benefited uh, to our detriment by uh, the acquiring of scientific knowledge uh, that they never, well maybe they could have eventually found it by themselves, but at their pace of going, uh, they, they couldn't have equaled what they have today. So some of these things, and if here and there uh, something goes too far, we'll rectify that. But I think what you heard about and read about uh, was just an attempt to close some of these avenues where just by reason of attendance at scientific forums uh, and seminars, they have gone home with uh, things that they have then turned to military advantage and the sophistication of their military buildup. For time, we thought that it was all quantity and that we were the masters of technology. But their technological sophistication uh, is a real threat to the whole peace-loving world and certainly to this nation and the rapid strides that they've made. So that's what's back of that, not any desire on our part to uh, close off legitimate uh, transfer of knowledge and information. Thank you, sir. Right. Now, I do have to go and you're going to get dessert. <laughs> Call. <laughs> <laughs> hey. so, so far as I'm concerned, the greatest.